Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pot here on the Dub Network. And my guest today is a good buddy of mine, spends his time between the U.S. and Canada, Mr. Greg Zahn. Zahni, how are you, sir? I'm good, man. How are you, bub? Uh, just taking it day by day these days, you know, trying to uh, yeah. just try to stay relevant as much as we can with the way uh, with the way our sport's going. I know. Uh, yeah. I'm right there with you, man. I'm, I'm I'm just trying to hang around and you know and stay relevant so that when the game comes to its senses and there's a renaissance back towards actual baseball people, um, you know that guys like you and I are hanging around that can actually teach the game and and uh, understand how it's supposed to be played. Uh, but you know, I, I preach to the choir. I'm sure everybody that played in our in our era understands that uh, what we're watching right now on the field at the major league level is just uh, just grotesque and it just seems fitting you're wearing uh jeff fry's shirt there the she gone nation it's something that he's that he started trying to get the, you talk about that renaissance of getting it back to how it was when we played you know it seems yeah. i mean we've talked about this numerous times with other guys it's just this it seems like the abilities have gone up but the numbers and everything are going down what's the problem oh. Well, there's no doubt they're, 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 I think they're more finely tuned athletes. Although I, I do fear that they're so specialized that when you throw them the proverbial curveball in life out there on the field, um, they don't really understand how to handle it. They're, they're definitely robots. Um, you know, and I can point, I can point back to the world series game um, where Nelson Cruz has the ball hit over his head by freeze in a situation where the only thing that could hurt the Texas Rangers at that point was an extra base hit. Um, a, he shouldn't have been in the game defensively at that point with the potential of winning the world series and B, how does a guy that's played that long, not understand no doubles. Are you kidding me? That's the robotic nature of what's going on. I watched in that bat the other day with Josh Thompson. He took three 90 mile an hour fastballs and didn't even pull the bat off his shoulder. Now, what's that tell you, Menchie? Is he sitting on something? Yeah, he's sitting on off-speed pitches the entire AB. Doesn't care about striking out because there is no onus on putting the ball in play at, at this point in the game's history. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. They literally don't care whether they strike out or not. They look at it, oh, it's an out. I don't care. The team doesn't care if I strike out. Look at Joey Gallo. What a joke. The guy's got a 205 lifetime batting average. He's still in the show after five or six years. Those guys are back in the semi-pros when you and I played. I don't yeah. care how far you can hit it. No. And just to let people know, the, we play no doubles. We play, it's if it goes over your head, it better go out of the ballpark. There should be no exactly. excuse for it. You know, people had talked about that that Nelson Cruz play. And him being out there, I th what I, from what I saw, I just he was probably more concerned with who he's going to jump on in the pile, right? And that's why you play those, those last three outs to figure it out. And... It's just, it, it's something that we're always taught. I mean, we tell, we teach our kids the same thing. You know, you look at them or you, you know, the, Hey, everything's going to second, you know, people look at, what are you doing? These kids, they need to know, understand how this game is played. And then, you know, you go to the hitting part of it, right? It's the averages are I mean, major league average, what, just above 200. I mean, the Mendoza line, is that going to become the standard to hit above? It can't be. It can't be. There's just, there's just only three outcomes in the game right now. Home run, strikeout, walk. It's the most boring thing I've ever seen. Now more than ever, with the substandard defenses that are out there, I mean they don't even teaching guys how to play defense anymore. When they do, they're 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 consulting the oracle, so to speak. They got, they got wristbands that NFL quarterbacks are wearing just to remind them that Kevin Mensch, you know, pulls the ball in the air and or goes the oppo in the air and freaking ground balls on the pole side. Like those are things that you and I memorized in a twenty minute scouting report meeting before every series, and these these kids don't have the mental capacity to remember so-and-so is a pole hitter in the air, other way on the ground, blah, 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 blah. Like, come on. It's just absolute robotics. Now they're not learning how to play the game. You know, I can't even find a job because some guy, some scouting director will say, or some farm director will say, well, you don't have, um, you know, the proper education on rap Soto and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I get a new cell phone every two years. I can figure it out. I mean, my attitude has always been, you know, the nerds belong in a cubicle outside the corner offices where the baseball guys are, are seated, the guys that make baseball decisions. I'm not saying analytics aren't great. I love them. 
That's how I called a great game. I was known for my game calling and my ball blocking and receiving. I could have never called a game the way I did and had as much success putting fingers down if I didn't understand analytics, if I didn't, we called them stats back then or scouting reports. You know, you, I could never ever be effective as a game caller unless I understood tendencies, when the guy's going to swing, how aggressive he was in certain situations, the strengths and weaknesses of my pitcher. Those are all statistically based situations that I took into account on the fly. Then you factor in my experience where having the ability to, you know, have a photographic memory with regards to how guys set up in the box. I could look straight down at the ground and know that David Ortiz was in the box just by where he set up and how his feet were positioned. And I could visually see his hot cold zones. The question was, did I have a pitcher on the mound that could get to those spots effectively? Uh, these guys right now are just absolutely slaves to the stats absolutely slaves to the stats they don't learn the game they're not being taught the game i mean heck just look at the 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 sign stealing controversy are you kidding me if you can't employ difficult enough signs that the other team can't decipher them you deserve to get your head kicked in here's an idea one doesn't always have to be a fastball two doesn't always have to be a curve who said it had to be why not just make one the curveball three a fastball you throw a wrench in their in their sign stealing system. I don't care how much video you got. You ain't gonna figure that out because every moron that's ever tried to steal a sign went into the equation thinking one's a fastball, two's a curve. Yeah, when you go out there when you know new pitchers come out, you're gonna go, you know, you go what outs plus two, right? When your counts. Now you've got the catchers with the the chest protector, what relaying a message almost like Morse <laughs> Morse code from the chest protector to the pitcher who takes his hat off. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And that's what I mean. It's, it, it, it's, they have to be handed what to do. And so, you know, you caught, you didn't catch. So if you were, you were the number one guy, you would catch what four or five days a week and have a couple of days off on your days yep. off where you, you weren't just sitting. Um, you weren't just sitting down. You were sitting there actually analyzing the game, learning to, to, to pick up tendencies. Like you said, and that, that, and that developed, like you said, your, uh, your photograph of memory to know what guys do, because eventually you're going to see these guys when you are starting that day or playing and understanding, okay, what we need to do. Now these guys, I mean, hell, you talk about cell phone, got guys sliding on the field, cell phones are coming out. Yeah, no, as a joke. I mean, I, once I got to the point in my career where, you know, well, I should say this, I got to the point in my career where I said to the to management, I'm not catching bullpens on my day off. I'm catching five, six days a week. You know, you got two bullpen catchers, let them handle it. You know, if I need to go down there and catch somebody that I've never seen before or call up, I will. But I spent most of my time in the video room watching video. I had two screens go on at the same time. One was the next day starter uh, that we were facing to see what his tendencies were on the mound so I could hit. Um, the other one was our game, watching to see what was going on. And then in my mind, I was comparing the guy that we had on the mound to other pitchers in the league that may or may not have had success against the hitting lineup of that team that day. And this is all work that I did, you know, before, during, after games. You know, I was always doing something to try to gain an edge. You know, I, I didn't consider myself the most physically gifted guy in the world, but mentally, you know, I was going to take you out if I could mentally, I was going to try to figure out a way to beat you with my, with my average major league talent. Um, and you know, these guys nowadays, all the work's being done for them. They're being told what to do. They don't have the freedom to freelance whatsoever. It's like, all right, you're, you're going to go up there and in two, one counts versus this guy, we're all sitting on a breaking ball. Well, you know what? It doesn't always work because it's funny the way that these guys go up there and they guess, and there's no other way to, to describe it. You got a guy throwing 92 mile an hour four seamers mid thigh down the middle and your best hitters late in a hitters count. He's sitting on breaking ball. I don't even think catchers are learning how to read, read bats anymore, which is something I was taught to do in like high school and, by my uncles. And that changes from pitch to pitch as well. Even in a Absolutely. bat, a guy, a guy, a ball inside and you see, you know, you're looking to see all right, the front hips flying. All right, we can go cut her away. All right. And, and making that adjustment, but you're right. They're not, they don't sound like they have to be told, okay, look, we need to, they're not following the flow of the game. They're always a step behind because it's, they're not able to move. I mean, I was watching, uh, I watched the Phillies yesterday, uh, real Muto guys on first and third and one out. And he's, you know, one leg down one, how are you supposed to throw somebody out with one leg down on the ground and two, 
the amount of I don't know what they're calling them now. Is it pass balls or wild pitches? But the amount of that has got to be astronomical compared to when you played of learning to block the ball and being ready to throw somebody out. I just don't see these guys even being ready to do either. Well, a there's only a handful of guys. I don't care what they say. Okay, first of all, the pop times are, shall we say, deflated. They artificially tell you, you know, that the, you know, pop times are one seven. Give me a break. You and I both saw Pudge, the greatest throwing catcher in the history of the game. He was a one seven on his best day. Low one eights all the time, but a one seven when things are were really clicking. You're telling me that you know some 15 year old kid in Canada can can drop a one seven. He can when he's throwing the ball, you know, releasing it five feet in front of home plate. Sure. So at the big league level, the average is still you know 2.0 seconds in the uh, in the tagging zone. And I was just told I was, there was going to be a fire alarm coming on. I'm going to have to walk outside to do the rest of this. But, you, you didn't pull you know, it, did like, you? You know, it, it's like, give me a break. First of all, on one knee, yeah, Pudge could throw guys out on one knee. I remember him doing it. Um, but those guys are so few and far between. And then the other thing about the one knee, and if it bounces, technically, Menchie, it's supposed to be a wild pitch. Yep. But when it's inside your knees and it bounces and you don't control the baseball, I call that a pass ball. Because yep. my attitude towards blocking balls, because I was, I was what I considered a very mobile catcher, because I started my career – weighing about a buck 65 my rookie year in the big leagues, but I could catch from outside line to outside line. I knew I called a breaking ball. You weren't throwing it by me. I was going to get chest protector on anything you threw. Uh, these guys nowadays, they got the wrong knee down. So, and I'll, and I'll explain this to you. Like I hate the one knee thing, especially with runners on base. And when, but when you're blocking to your right, so for instance, you're a catcher, you've got a right-handed pitcher on the mound. His breaking ball is going to go to your right. All right. So if you're catching from a, a standard type of stance, the first thing that hits your hits the ground when you go to block a ball to your right is your right knee. So shouldn't that be the one that's down when you're in a one knee stance so that you can push off your left side? Watch these games. They have the wrong knee down because they think they're going to be able to throw guys out. I'm sorry. If you're going to go one knee with runners on base, just give up on being able to throw guys out because it's not going to happen with any kind of regularity. And honestly, there are probably way more balls in the dirt than there are stolen base attempts. But I can tell you, if I was managing these one knee catchers, I'd be delayed stealing. I'd be wreaking havoc on these guys. I would make them cry and get up off of their feet because they're wasting their time down there. They're not even giving ground level targets. They're giving, you know, dick high targets when they're on one knee. What's the point? I don't Why know. are you on a knee if you're going to give a chest high target? Is makes it, no sense. Is this what you got is the this wrong knee down taught? and you're doing it the wrong way and you're giving a high target. It's a waste of time. So this must be taught throughout the, throughout the system now of just uh, it's it's one knee down or the the leg straight out to the right. You know these guys yep. are doing let, what do you I don't understand. You're exposing yourself right to one say to a foul ball or something. You're there your gears there to protect you. I mean they, Yeah, they I mean, don't care about that. No, and that's what I mean is it is it? I don't. I don't even understand it really. What? Well, uh, you can re, you can remember Tony Pena. Mm -hmm. that, to me, that's a one knee stance. All right, that's 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 your your junk in the dirt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm allowed to say on this podcast. Oh, you say whatever but, you, you know. want, Donnie. There's all nothing right, here. That's that that that's that's freaking dick in the dirt right there. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you do it. That's how you go to one knee. Uh, this one knee thing, where like I said, where they're the catchers are giving their target at the chest level. What's the point? The whole idea of getting down on one knee is to get the low strike. But if your target's at chest level, you're still going to have to go down and get it. The way I teach my catchers, they don't have to do any of that stuff. They get all the work done before the ball gets there. They stick that low strike. They don't move it around, embarrass the umpires. I mean, when you and I played, if you moved it at all, the umpire would be, you know, motherfucking you left and right going, stop showing me up. These guys are pissed. I, I, I talked to a number of them on Instagram and Facebook they're embarrassed by what's going on in the game of baseball. These guys are not getting any more strikes called than they were when we were playing. In fact, all they're doing is making themselves look stupid. They can't keep a ball in front of them. You got games ending on wild pitches when the guy was already on one knee to begin with. They're not getting more than more strikes called. They're not throwing people out. It's a joke. It's so ugly. And, and I understand you might want to do it because the guy can't catch and you can't find another spot for him. And, but guess what? There's a DH in both leagues now. 
if the guy's that good a hitter, find a spot for him somewhere without without the gear on. Because I'm here to tell you, he's going to have a huge effect on a ball game. More than a hundred pitches are going to be thrown every single game. He has an effect on what's being called, what's how it's being received, whether or not he gets blocked. And let's be honest, if you can't control the baseball, you might as well save yourself the pain. Let it hit the backstop. Give him a quarter of a run, which is what each base is. Every time a guy advances, that's a quarter of a run. Give it to him and hope your team can make up for it with the bats in their hands. Plain and simple. Catching is a, is a travesty right now. It makes me sick to my stomach to watch it. In fact, I don't watch it. I can't watch it. So I know when you were towards the end of your career, you were, you would have pitchers that would want to throw just to you, right? You would have yep. your days, right? So do you think you still see that nowadays, or is it just um, your starters are going to play what, four days, day off, play two, and then be off on Sunday? I don't know if they're doing personal catchers anymore. You know, they Believe it or not, you know, I was the personal catcher for a lot of guys and going back to my rookie year, you know, I was always, you know, the defensive guy. I wasn't a hitter until later in my career. You know, I couldn't do any damage. I was a punch and Judy at best. You know, my, my job when I played as a backup, the first eight years of my career was just not to fuck the game up, you know, go out there and call a good game. But what happened was the starting pitchers on almost every single team that I played in or played on preferred me because other than Charles Johnson, I was the guy that cared about them. You know, uh, I called a good game. It mattered to me. I wasn't worried about only throwing guys out or getting my hits. Um, I was worried about blocking everything, throwing guys out, calling a great ball game, you know, giving them a chance to, to get us a win. But believe it or not, I don't believe in the whole personal catcher thing. And the reason why I watched the Atlanta Braves for a decade have to sit Javi Lopez, their starting catcher, every first game of every playoff series because Greg Maddox didn't want to throw to him. Yep. That can't happen. You know, you figure out a way to make it work guys. Um, you know, it helped me being a switch hitter. They didn't have to worry about which day they were going to give the starter off. I was flattered that guys wanted to throw to me. Um, and I imagine it's probably still the case. I mean, if Yadi Molina's the guy that's behind the dish, even today I would be like, yeah, I want Yachty behind the dish. The guy's a tremendous game caller, still one of the best throwing catchers in the game blocks like crazy. You know, he understands the game. He's a veteran. Yeah. You'd want him. You're more, I mean, do you want Gary Sanchez on your day? Every fifth day? Probably not. Unless he goes out there and he goes one for four with three RBIs and you get a W you definitely don't want that guy behind the dish, but I'm sure there's a handful of guys in the league that, that are, you know, probably known for their defense. I don't know who they are. Cause like I said, as soon as I see the one knee stuff, I'm out, I'm gone. Start to get a little sick to my stomach, maybe throw up a little in my mouth and turn the channel. I can, I, other than Yachty, I can't really think of anybody that's just been established that actually has, you know, can just can continue to do the, the, just the basic catcher drills, the basic catcher things to be able to, I was watching some just old hitting video uh, at home myself. Uh, Pudge was catching. I'm at the plate and just knowing, looking as you see him behind the box before he would get set, he would look just to see what I was doing as far as my feet or anything else. And then would adjust. Now I just see yeah. guys calling signs and then they just sit there. They don't even, it's just like they have, it's almost like they have tunnel vision. They don't even pick up on anything of the other, the other parameters that are going on in the box. Well, they don't have to because all right, first of all, if you are relaying signs, the fuck are they going to do about it? They're not going to do anything. When I was playing, you got caught, you got somebody ear flapped. Yep. Plain and simple. I, I, we did it all the time. I would call for a slider down and away, knowing full well that we were getting fastball up and in. Let the guy at, at second base relay the signs, and then the guy at home plate wore it. And then the guy that was relaying the signs either got an earful the next time he came to the dish, or he got ear flapped. Plain and simple. That, that shut that crap down real quick. They don't even have to look at that because, you know, they're, they're, Across the game, they have lowered the level of excellence so that everybody can participate. I'll, I'll point, point to it right away. You're talking about catching? Absolutely. They've lowered the level of excellence. So you don't even have to have a guy who can catch and throw anymore. You just put some knucklehead back there that can go to one knee and maybe knock the ball down. They don't even have to catch it to get the ball called a strike. My rookie year, I actually had an umpire tell me, if you can't catch it cleanly, couldn't have been a strike. If you had to move it, couldn't have been a strike. And don't ask me to describe them, son. I just call them plain and simple. 
Um, these guys nowadays, they're backstops. They don't even, they don't receive the ball properly. I'm surprised we're not seeing more broken thumbs with, with the hand position that they're in with their point, their thumb pointed straight down at the ground. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. And then you look at the way they juice the baseballs and don't even try to tell me that the balls aren't juiced. The average home run output for a guy with 600 or more plate appearances in the show now is 20. You got guys like Jose Altuve, all five foot four of them. Hobbits like him are hitting 375 foot opposite field homers. You and I both know that's a physically impossible task with a legitimate baseball. I'm surprised. No stinking way. I'm surprised that baseballs then, haven't then, blown up. Oh, good lord! And then you, and then well, I and I understand they're swinging out of their ass. They're not even worried about choking up and making contact with two strikes. Like Jose Altuve, he just swings out of his ass left and right. Can't take a walk. Won't take a walk. I don't care. Even then. Him hitting 30 bombs, him hitting 370 foot, 75 foot oppos, it's a joke. The balls are juiced out of their minds. Proof in the pudding. 40% increase in home runs the year that AAA baseball started using the same balls as Major League Baseball. You're telling me the semi pros got that much better in one offseason? No stinking way. No that, stinking way. Oh my gosh. Remember the year they had bud balls? Back early two oh. thousands, they were basically like, they were almost restricted flight baseballs. <laughs> exactly, you had to lean on one. Like I remember the first opposite field home run I ever saw. Guess who? Manny Ramirez in the minor leagues in Canton, Akron. Unstinking believable. I my jaw hit the floor. I was like, what just happened? I had never seen one before. It, you know, and these guys. I was watching a video the other day. Um, of a college kid hitting a pop up to left in a tournament and the ball's flying out of the yard. I'm like, wow, they're even juicing the balls at the, at the lower levels to make these kids look like they're something special. And it's these, it's just, they're trying you to know what it looks like. Yeah. And when they're trying to create, they're trying to make everybody an Aaron judge type of thing. These, these six foot eights, you know, Hondos, they're trying to make them be out to be these giant men to hit these baseballs. And it's, I mean, it's the strikeouts are through the are through the roof. And you talk, you talk yeah. about especially now, guys just throw right. When when we were playing, guys were able to pitch, and you know, guys that threw hard. And, and now you have guys guessing. How can you guess if guys are throwing ninety five plus? I mean, that's the aver right average. And yeah. you, how can you sit on something else? You're just you're making yourself look like a fool. Oh, Manchi, if I was you, right on right, I'd be terrified. But I was a switch hitter, and I and I like to call myself Neo. Because I'd go matrix on that because I got to see it a long time. You know what I mean? Yep. But it, I would be terrified. I remember at the end of my career, I was uh, facing guys like Kyle Farnsworth and Carlos Marmol, uh, Jabba Chamberlain, guys that could throw 95 plus. But once you realize that it's only for show and they're going to go to the breaking ball or the changeup, Fernando Rodney, they're going to go to the off speed stuff when they have to throw a strike. Uh, then you kind of get a little bit more comfortable. And it was a hell of a lot more easy for me being left on right, right on left, seeing it come across to me. Um, I don't know how you guys would do it. I'd be terrified because if you guess wrong, you get, you can, you could die. And that's uh, what it is. They it, just throw it for nowadays. For all the deep laps. Oh yeah. Oh, they were, you know, it's basically, they go up there. It's, it's almost like they're hitting in full catching gear these days. Elbows, yeah. face, man. I don't know why you should try hitting with just a catcher's mask on instead. Cause you played yeah. with guys that threw hard. I mean, AJ's one of them. Burnett. AJ could just let it fly, and that thing would just come out like a like a like a frozen like a fried egg, just and ball just exploding out of his hand. But they had control for the most yeah. part. When they needed to let oh, one go, they they could. Now it just seems like trying to find the zone with it is is the hard part. Have you seen the training videos that are out there where they're teaching these guys? I mean, you can picture picture Nuke Lelouch from the movie Bull Durham when he's using his parietal eye, he's coming down the mound with almost his back to the catcher and they land. And then all of a sudden they unload. They're not looking to, to hit a side of the plate. They're, they're looking to make it spin and move as much as they can at the greatest velocity that they can. That's why the two seamer and the cutter are so, you know, in vogue now because they sweep the zone. There's no spotting up. And honestly, if I threw a hundred, I'd be throwing four seamers, belt high down the middle challenging guys to hit it because i know you're not gonna be able to get on top of that um they don't have any command i'd be terrified absolutely terrified but you know what nobody pitches in on purpose nobody 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 buzzes the tower on purpose anymore they're all scared to death and they're all best friends go go sit around the batting cage at a ball game i went i went to one last year here in cleveland i used my my gold card so ah, you know what i'll take my nephew to a ball game and uh 
So we went down for BP and I watched and it was a suck fest. Like these guys are out there absolutely blowing each other before the game. And I was like, it used to make me sick. Like I, I used to tell David Ortiz, I'm like, dude, get the fuck out of here. Stop, you know, take these guys out to dinner. I love you. I love you, Poppy. But dude, we got to at least give the appearance that we're, we're not in love with each other and that we're, we're going to try to beat each other out there on the field. And oh, guess what? What happens with one of my guys drills you in the ribs and we got to fight? You know, <laughs> like, come on. These guys are all like, oh, you know, and and then they do all their they do all their 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 lipping off on Twitter. They, I can't even believe the stuff that I hear about guys guys having Twitter wars. Grown men, grown men, baseball players, chirping each other on Twitter. Gone are the days you know? where you could just run over and, and just uh, punch somebody in the face, right? It was that oh, was Jock Peterson got slapped over fantasy football by uh, who was it? Yeah, I, I mean that's <laughs> this yeah. is what a joke. Yeah, the fact is, that he didn't react with like a barrage of haymakers in return just shows you all you need to know about that punk. Ex- but exactly. you know what? Though they're all punks, in my opinion. They let each other disrespect. They get disrespected every single day on a ball diamond. Now you tell me, you're sitting there with me watching a ball game. You know, we're in Toronto where we played together, and we watch somebody get taken deep, and somebody's twirling the bat and dancing around. You know, I don't know about you, but I was like, this guy's a punk. Dude, I'm going to dig in next time I face this dude. He, he ain't going to do nothing about it. I'm going to swing out of my ass, and he ain't, there ain't nothing he's going to do about it. So you're basically, when you allow that kind of shit to happen on a baseball field, on national television, you're basically announcing to the world that you're a beta. Come take advantage of me. Come steal food off my plate. Have That's you had those joke. conversations with, with batters? I mean, with that kind of stuff happening, you know, the bat flips and everything else, as a catcher, what's your first thought? Are you one? <laughs> I can see you, Zonny, just chasing them down first base line if they just stand there and oh. watch, or when they cross, don't even let them cross home plate, just standing there. No, there, I, there was a couple of times. Well, here, here's my thought: if you hit thirty every year, you get to, you get a little bit of latitude. You earn the right to watch it a little longer. But I can tell you, you know, even Poppy Manny, those guys weren't like grotesquely disrespectful. I mean, those guys were hitting thirty bombs a year, driving at a hundred, winning World Series titles. Those are the guys. I mean, Barry Bonds, you know, did Barry freaking do anything crazy? No. I mean, the only thing I remember Barry doing when he knew he hit it, the big record breaker, he put his hands up and he stood there at home plate and he did a little spin move. You know, I'm like, okay, Barry deserved it. But when you got a guy like pimping stuff, you know, when they haven't earned the right to, absolutely not. We're going to fight. Because you ain't disrespecting my guy. I'm, I mean, chances are I'm either going to chase him down the line, or I'm going to I'm going to throw a, I'm going to throw a haymaker before he even gets to home plate. We're going to fight right there on the field. I'm, they're slapping five need, on their way to, out of the box, so they're if they're on the first base side. I mean, the bat they're yeah. handing it to the first base coach. You know, just yeah. running down there. That's and you've always you know notice they still they wait till the guy crosses before they give the pitch of the ball. But I'm surprised they don't step in front of the catchers nowadays to say hey before something happens. You no, know, it's a joke. I mean, I, the, the one thing I can be thankful of is that none of that beta crap was going on when I was on the field. I mean, <laughs> I can't even imagine, like, if somebody tried to pull that crap on A.J. Burnett, Doc, <laughs> Doc, holy crap. Like, there's no, there, and nobody would. Doc was a big, imposing guy. B.J. Ryan, are you kidding me? He would have torn, torn somebody limb from limb. We all grew up in an era where the stars were respected you know, they got a little bit more latitude, but everybody else played the game with respect. You walk somebody off, you know what, have a little fun, you know, high five, you know, cheer, you know, whatever, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe if you know, you got it, you could watch it a little bit, but it better be a walk off. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm just like, nah, uh, uh-uh. I got respect for my, for my, my, my opponents I got respect for the game, all this showboat and look at me, dig me crap. No, nah. but you know what? Like I said, people, well, you can treat people how they'll allow you to be to treat them. So if you're a beta and you're giving up bombs and guys are falling down swinging at you, well, you get what you deserve. If you don't want that to happen, if you want to be a motherfucker out there and you want people to be a little bit tentative digging in and maybe not swing out of their ass, well, get ready to fight. Throw somebody up and in, drill somebody in the rib cage, and then and then deal with it. I tell people online all the time because I get chirped about it, all these new new age fans. I say, look, you go ahead and you do you, boo. I'll do me. You do you, I'll do you. If you offend me, I'm going to do me, and you're not going to like the results. It's going to become very uncomfortable for you really quickly. 
because you play with guys. There are some guys that were that were hotheads, but they still understand you know, the respect of the game. You know, if somebody took Doc deep, can you imagine if somebody took Halliday deep and stood there and watched it? He probably would have walked, ran right over to the first to the first base line and probably tried to lay somebody out. Oh, guaranteed, guaranteed. It's, I remember my first at bat against him, and that was, I had been his teammate for five years. I hit a double over Vernon's head, and he shot laser beams threw his eyeballs at me while I was standing at second base. He was just pissed. I got a base hit off him. I would never think about showing him up. Give me a break. Like Kevin Brown. Oh, good Lord. Could you, I can't even imagine. He was a big, strong son of a bitch. And I tell you what, nobody tried to disrespect him. They were already scared to death to walk to the plate with a bat in their hand. Cause they knew they were going to go back with it in a couple of pieces. If he didn't get five bats a game, I, I was like, you suck tonight. You know, same with Mariana. You, you didn't take your good wood up there, but Kevin was me on game day. He was a motherfucker. Uh, Holiday, same way. Those guys were brought up the right way. Even guys, I mean, even the fun loving dudes like David Wells, you know, dude, I mean, Jamie Moyer threw 75 miles an hour at the end of his career, but I guarantee you didn't disrespect him. You didn't disrespect anybody on his teammates. He'd go out there and he'd handle business. Somebody would wear one in the rib cage. And if you want to fight, go. And I tell, when I was coaching, I tell my, my kids, my kids, I said, look, you know, what's fun winning championships. You know, what's fun being the best player on the field, understanding that everybody's scared to death of you. I said, you guys pull that crap. Just, just go home. Just go get in the car with your mom and dad. I said, you get one of my players hit for being an idiot. We're going to have problems. If somebody does something, if the opponents do something stupid, we're going to handle our business and we're going to do it with our mouth shut. We don't even need to lip off. You're just going to know plain, plain and simple right away. If somebody shows up, one of our guys up, they're going to go down. If not the next guy, maybe more more than one, because I was always a two for one kind of guy. The guy that did it, he's going down. The guy that's at the plate right now, he, the, their best player needs to wear it. Their best player needs to wear it, so he knows that he's going to. And I'm sure, Menchie, I'm sure you've been in clubhouses where you know your pitchers were, you know, throwing at guys when they shouldn't have been. The best player on the team or guys on your in your lineup were getting smoked and they were and they were mad about it and they were taking they were taking it right to the guy's face in the clubhouse. If not a fight, but there was definitely a chance that there was going to fight in the clubhouse because the guy's being stupid. Because they care, because you cared about each other at that point. That guy didn't at that moment until you had the veteran guys there to be able to put them in their place. You know, we talk about you know being on deck. Guy hits a home run and pimps it. Nowadays, our first thought, my first thought was, if I'm going to get drilled. I'm going to, I'm going to lay the dude out in front of me to happen, but you know, going up to the box and saying, Hey, he's on it. Just make sure it doesn't hit me in the head. Right. Guys will tell you, we knew what was coming. We just yep. wanted to make sure that, that it wasn't, you know, intent up at the head or whatnot. We knew it was coming. It was just a matter of, okay, just make sure it doesn't hit me up there. And you know, now I'm sure it's just a matter of, uh, they let it, they let it carry over and it goes on to Twitter. Right. And then you had yep. like the whole Batista thing, right. The home run, you had every opportunity to, to handle that whole situation. And you let it just fester and fester until finally it just becomes a powder keg. And then you have the brawl here over the whole thing. Well, they had, they, I, you know what? I remember Gibby was pissed off about the way the Rangers handled it. I didn't give a shit. I thought they handled it just fine because you know, they didn't, it was their, it was their revenge, not the blue Jays. They did it when they wanted to do it. They did it when it made sense for them. <laughs> and honestly, you go look at Jose's numbers. He dominated the Rangers up until that point. He was crap against the Rangers because he was anticipating getting smoked the entire season. And then they finally smoked him. And, and my favorite moment in baseball history, Rugden Odor smoking that punk in the face. It was awesome. I absolutely adore that guy for, for drilling Jose in the face. Um, it was, they, they handled it the way they wanted to handle it. And that's their revenge to be handled the way they want to handle it. It's not for me as the guy getting drilled to decide, Oh yeah, if you're going to drill me, do it now when it means absolutely nothing. I loved it, honestly. Yeah. And, 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 and that's how you do it. Look at how many at bats Jose, Jose Bautista gave up because he was afraid to get hit against the Texas Rangers that year. So they, they, they screwed him over a bunch of times. Not only did they did, did they mess up his at bats for the entire season, they drilled him, and then they drilled him. Yeah. So it was it was awesome for me. I loved it because there's a lot of people that think that 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 bat flip by Jose in the uh, in the playoffs was justified or respectful. No, it's not. No, it was not. Okay, that was a childish player who thought that the umpires in that game were screwing the Toronto Blue Jays. There were two major calls in that game. 
the umpires got them both right. You remember Russell Martin dinks what's his name in the head, the left handed batter, uh, the Asian kid. I can't remember his name. Two. Hits him in the head with a throwback to the mound. That's a live baseball. I was the only one in the ballpark that knew it was a live baseball because it happened to me in a ball. So it was one of those situations where the umpires got both of those calls, right. And the Toronto fans were like crying the blues. Everybody's against us. Everybody is Toronto against everybody. I'm sure you saw the t-shirts after. Well, Jose thought that the, the, the blue Jays were getting screwed. He was being childish. I'm sure he imagined pimping that whole thing in his brain before it happened. Cause it's my belief that all these celebrations are premeditated, but if you go back and you watch the video, he hit it. Everybody in the yard knew it was going out. He looked into the Rangers. And then he threw his bat at him. Yeah. Come on. That's a respectful uh, response to what was going on. No, it wasn't. That was complete and utter disrespect for the, the Texas Rangers and the game of baseball. And he got what was coming to him and spades. And I loved every minute of it. And it, you said it just... Uh, you don't, you just don't see that anymore. It just becomes, and, if, and even the umpires will tell us they want us to police the game, but but they their their hands are tied, right? And now all of a sudden, they're gonna have I, I saw what robot umpires here soon, completely. Yeah, yeah, what? That's a joke. I mean, this is what I mean. It's just why even play the game? Why don't we just sit here, play it on video games, and you know, and everybody can build their stats. You know, you can build your team like uh, baseball stars from Nintendo. Remember, you could build a great team and do all this. Oh yeah, and not have it. And what's and what? And then what's the point then? What what has become of of baseball itself? I mean, even I think in any sport, really, you can't even police yourselves. You know, hockey you used to have somebody go out there and go get somebody. Now now you can't. Hey, we have to oh. actually have to ask somebody to fight. Yeah, I'll probably punch catch him holy hell from Canadian fans for saying this, but the the whole reason Connor McDavid can puck handle the way he does in the game of hockey is because he can skate with his eyeballs down. You know, 20 years ago, if you were skating with your head down across the middle of the ice, you were going to get absolutely pummeled. Somebody was going to like ruin your life. Now these guys can skate around with their eyes on the puck. Of course they're great puck handlers. They're not, they're not looking up up. They, they're not, they're staring right at their stick in the puck. And they're not allowed to hit anybody anymore. It's a joke. It's just like the NFL. Why do you think guys who are six foot four who can throw the ball on a line 40 yards are multi-millionaires, borderline billionaires by the time they recover, by the time they retire? Nobody can touch them. You can't hit them. What happened to the days of that six foot four inch middle linebacker that ran a six or a four, a four five forty coming around the end and absolutely terrifying guys? Quarterbacks here in footsteps, they don't hear shit anymore. They just stand back there, jump in the pocket, throw a 40 year old 40, 40 yard dart. And they don't have any worries at all. It's like being a middle infielder at second base. They don't even have to worry about getting punted anymore. That was my favorite thing to do besides getting run over at home plate. Cause I was zero for a lot. That's what I was yeah, saying. I was just two, thinking about that. I, you. I was zero for a lot. Benji. I, if I had a chance to block the dish and save our team a run or break up a double play and punt some middle infielder into left field and make him throw the ball into the, into the, into the stands and we get a run out of it or an RBI for a teammate, whew, I'm going. That's how I got my, that's how I got my bell rung. Mother's day, 2005. I went in to break up a double play. Then the ninth inning of a ball game, the second baseman hit me in the side of the head with a knee and broke my neck and knocked me out. I was unconscious for four minutes, but I was trying to do my job. Yeah. But then, but they've changed it now, you know, from the Utley slide, which was, which was dirty. I mean, you're a catcher now, you know, especially on somebody's on second base of who's there, right? What's going to happen here? Is oh, it yeah. going to be, here comes Carlos Lee coming around third. You, you're prepared for it. Now it's just, uh, eh, it doesn't matter. They can't do anything to me. But it's, I mean, what were your thoughts? I mean, who hit you? Did anybody really just lay into you at the plate? Oh, God, yeah. Uh, well, Ian Desmond pretty much ended my career. Uh, it was the fast guys. The fast guys were the ones that hurt the most. Um, He's built like a linebacker, though, too. Oh, I played with Desmond. And big. Yes. The, big, the big lumbering guys, they didn't, they didn't do anything to you. They weren't moving fast enough. Uh, the fast guys hit me, hit me really good. But, I, you know, I had one of those techniques where – I was literally not going to give you the plate. I, I put my body between the runner and home plate on every play. Um, I, I had developed a, a technique where, you know, I stood behind the plate so that I can see the runner coming around third. You know, a lot of guys, you know, when I was being taught, they would have their left heel on the corner of the plate with their toes pointed up the third baseline. 
but you lose the runner when he rounds third. Yep. I stood behind home plate and I always put myself in a position where I was moving up into the baseline as I was making a play. Um, even, even today's rules, the Buster Posey rule, um, which is a whole nother conversation. Uh, it wouldn't bother me because I'm technically always in the act of making a play. A lot of catchers in the game today are afraid to block the plate because they feel like they're going to be static and they're not giving a lane. Give a lane, but as you're catching the ball, be moving into the baseline. Just because the throw's online doesn't mean you can't move yourself into the baseline. Uh, you're always technically in the act of making a play, whether the throw's online or not. Reaching out and sweep tagging is a joke. Um, I would love to be playing with all these designer slides where guys are going in head first or trying to reach back with their hand. I'd be dislocating shoulders left and right. It'd be freaking hilarious. The old Ken yeah, Huckabee I mean, on Derek Jeter. Oh. Oh, pummel! I would be crushing guys. There'd, there'd be no, there'd be there'd be a disabled list that's a mile long. Come and sl come slide into me head first and see what happens to you. So if you know, here's a, so if it, it would have been Greg Zahn instead of Buster Posey, would that rule have changed? No chance. That was the story I was getting ready to tell you. Um, and here's the funny thing: go back and watch the video. Buster was in his initial position, was perfectly lined up to deliver to 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 take the throw perfectly lined up but then he moved his foot at the last minute and and that marlins guy folded him up yep um my whole technique was i want to get my my left knee pointed straight up the line as i'm coming into the line from behind the plate and the first thing i did was i took the forehead of my hockey mask and i would attempt to put it on the bridge of your nose yep and you never Every took it off now too and those things were, were designed for that with you know and it was it just that's just part of it right flipping guys you know guys running oh. at second base i mean you were just that's just how we were taught it was just it was hard nosed it was it was baseball right it's just yep. and it's just it's not anymore i mean why even have anybody oh. back there it's ugly it's it's gross it's it's soft it's you know like there's more than one way to affect a ball game than you know hitting a home run you know you could be 0 for 4 but you break up a double play and your team wins i mean and, the, and the, you know what the most ironic thing about the whole breaking up double plays thing is it was Chase Utley, another middle infielder. Now, some people think the slide was dirty. I don't think it was dirty. I just think it was unfortunate that I think his name was Tejada. I think he was just in a bad position. Um, but the, the ironic thing about it is, you know, in our clubhouse, at least Chase was known for hearing footsteps before we played Chase Utley. Every single time we talked about going in hard, get under Chase's feet. He will throw the ball into, into the stands. And it ends up being him that slides in and gets everybody in, a, in an uproar about breaking up double plays. It was the most hilarious thing in the whole wide world. It wasn't some, some you know, animal, some guy that, that just loved to beat people up. And there were plenty of those guys. I mean, Carl Crawford, man, that guy, not Carl Crawford. Uh, shoot, I can't remember. This one outfielder I played with for a blip. This guy, he used to relish blowing up catchers. Man, he, he was great at it, too. He was fast and strong. And he, any chance he got to blow up a catcher, he was going to blow you up. And he had a reputation for it. But Chase Utley, of all guys going into second base, a scared middle infielder is the one that ends up having a slide that changes baseball for, well, hopefully not forever, but for a good period of time. I mean, because when we played, you could have, as long as you could get your hand in a bag, you could be a full body length either way. And guys yep, would learn could, to jump yep. over. Now it's, they don't even have, you don't have to do anything, right? You slide nope. into the bag and that's it. Yeah. And, I mean, and the, and the greatest, to me, the greatest weapon was, you go in, if the guy wasn't smart enough or quick enough to get outside the baseline, you'd go in with a pop-up slide and roll a hip into him, and he'd go freaking flying in the air, you know? But, you, I mean, even 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 Fry Daddy, you know, Mr. Shigong, there's a great picture of him on his website where he's coming over a, a runner's hip, but he, you see his eyeballs. His eyeballs are on first base on the throw. You know, it's just part of Those guys learned how to do that. They learned how to be upended and not get clobbered. And they knew who was they, over there at first, knew. especially. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Zoni's at first right now. We, you better know that he's coming hard, you know, appealing. I remember the old uh, Albert Bell and uh, was it Joey Fernando Cora? Vina. Or Fernando Vigna. Fernando yeah. Vina. That was unbelievable. That was, I mean, but that was totally legal. Yeah. You know? And why wouldn't you? What did, was, was, was Albert Bell worried about getting beat up by Fernando Vigna or anybody else on the Brewers for that matter? Not even close. Everybody was terrified of Albert. 
And that was, the, but that was that was what was fun about it of knowing what you could do. Oh, I, I can't get away with that one here. I can get away with such and such, right? You were able to 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 know. And you were a smaller guy though too. But even catching wise, you were a smaller target. You know, there now these guys yep. are bigger targets, and yet and I don't think people would try and run them over. You know, if somebody no. the size of Carlos Lee is standing behind the plate, uh, yeah, I'm probably not going to win that battle, even if I have the momentum. You yeah, know, but and you they, knew what they don't understand is the physics of it. You yeah. know, if you're if you're low to the ground, you have the you have the advantage. You know, lower to the ground, you got, I mean, honestly, I mean, low to the ground doesn't mean crap when you weigh 155, 165 pounds, like me when my rookie year, uh, yeah, I was a, in, I was a, a target, but I was t- too stupid to know to get out of the way. Um, you know, I took some lumps early on, especially with the old school mask. I had it torn off my face a number of times. I mean, back then guys would come in and forearm your face. Yeah. Did you like I mean, those masks and, and better? It was than up hockey? to your pitching staff to take care of you. If they thought you getting forearmed in the face was, you know, out of bounds. Yeah, you know what? What was I going to do? All 165 pounds of me against some, you know, some guy like Cal Ripken size. I mean, not that he ever forearmed me in the face, but I'm using him as an example because he was, you know, six three, six four, 240 pounds. I couldn't do nothing against that guy. But shoot, physical intimidation is gone. It was a part of men's pro sports. It is gone. It should still be a, far, a part of the sports, but it's not. No, it's you're right. I think it, well, what's it come down to, though, Zoni? Money. If you weren't, like I said, it's either if it was if it was Greg's on, okay, you were only making a hundred thousand, and, and Buster Posey making seven million. Uh, we can lose that one. We can't lose this. So then, oh, we got to change this rule because now we're losing. It's occupational hazard, is what yep. it is. What it comes down to, you know, I we, we sign up for it. As soon as you sign up to play baseball, hockey, whatever it is, that's part of it. You, you can't. Oh, I want. I'll play, but only if uh, this doesn't happen. Or th- no, it's just a part of it. You know, that'd be like signing up to be a police officer. I'll do it, but if but nobody can point a gun or shoot. No, wait, time out here. No, it's it's part of it. It's either you're either all in or all out, and that's what happened. Yeah. It's part. It's everybody wants little pieces of this and that to be able to do it, and it's just it's tearing it apart from, especially for us. What what us older guys see is just this is not what we're what it's about. Yeah, no, it's 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 completely gone. It's not a game that I can that I can watch anymore. I mean, the fans are turning it off. The All Star game this year had the lowest ratings in 100 years. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's it's just not a fun game to watch anymore. I mean, I always tell people if 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 if, if it bothers your your frail sensibility to watch a guy, another man truck another guy, then don't don't watch. But these are the same people that watch football or so UFC. Just baseball doesn't mean it can't be a contact sport. Exactly. Give me a break. Exactly. I mean, now I, th- I think of football, they're wearing what uh, bubbles on top of their helmets or double bubbles. And you have know. you seen that? <laughs> so, 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 so nobody gets hit hard in, in training camp. What's going to happen when that first collision happens on opening day and you're not conditioned to handle it. That'd be like, that'd be like them using mush balls for my blocking practice in spring training. Yeah. Uh, that first, that first, that first, you know, slider off my groin it's going to probably bring me to tears in a game situation. If I haven't been conditioned to six weeks of spring training to, to be able to deal with that pain and, and perfect my, my technique so that I don't get clobbered. Like, Holy crap. What, what are we, what are we doing? You said, you think they even work on the blocking anymore other than, or is it just catching bullpens spring training? You go catch. Uh, bullpen. That's it. They probably just shoot balls right at them now. They probably just shoot them right, right, right at them, so they don't have to move. Because honestly, if you're going to be on one knee, you ain't getting nothing outside. If if it's outside the frame of your body, you're not getting it. You're not going to be able to control it. That's why you see a bunch of Olays because they know they can't get there. Most of them have, as I said, the wrong knee down. You know, if we were on television, I could, I could, I could like get on. Well, I don't know. I have shorts on. I'm not skinning my knees for anybody, but I could show you how you get it done. You know, you push off. You land on you, you land on your lead knee, whether you're going right or left, but the push off happens in the rear leg. It, it happens. It, it it actually gets you turning. It gets you down on the ground. It gets you going forward so that you're gaining ground on the ball. These guys are static. They're letting the ball eat them up. I I I, I don't know. It's just uh, and it starts. I'm thinking at a younger at a young age. I mean, kids even you know 12, 13 don't know how to block a baseball in the dirt they don't know what they're doing and it's just but these guys you know they talk about this this new school well well, baseball's evolving yeah it is but you're still creating this laziness to not be able to help your pitchers or the rest of your team out by by doing it if you 
just the basic stuff. I mean, everybody has to add their spin to it, right? Everybody, try, try this drill out for a catcher as opposed to the one leg out to the side or, um, you know, most guys, they were, you know, guys that would sit on those two, on the inside part of the feet, you know, really low, but still, you yeah. know, both feet. I mean, you don't even see that anymore. Yeah, the Sal Posados, Charlie Greens of the world, me early in my career before I got old and decrepit. Uh, yeah, you know, Bob Boone, Bob Boone sat really, really low almost with his ass on the ground. Um, there was a, there was a, a, a value to a low target. Like I said, now they're on one knee right now and they're given a chest high target. What's the point? Um, your mobility is, is, is zero. Um, like it, it's just, look, I, I, I am all for evolution. I'm all for changes in the game, but there are certain things that have devolved the game. Like I'll go to the most simple one that I that I wish they'd get rid of maple bats. They need to get rid of maple bats before they kill somebody. You know as well as I do. Yeah, they're harder. You hit a ball farther with them, but when they break, they break, and dangerous pieces of wood are flying through the air. Somebody's going to get stuck with one, and they're going to die on a baseball field. And they're going to. And baseball, being the reactionary sport that it is, they will wait till somebody dies before they before they get rid of maple bats. There's one. Okay, I was all for the idea of Moneyball, especially when somebody like Billy Bean is trying to trade for me five times while I'm playing for other teams because I had a high on base percentage. Um, it was flattering, but let's be honest: working counts just to work counts doesn't get it done. You work counts so that you can afford to swing and miss. You want to be out front with your contact points so you can do extra base damage. And then when you get two strikes, you back the thing up and you put the ball in play. That's what working counts is all about. So you can afford to swing and miss. All right. So the money ball thing, it made sense, especially for a small market club. They're finding undervalued products that they think can get the job done at the big league level, but it's been proven not to work. So abandon ship. Same thing with this analytics and the launch angle and all this other stuff. Hey, it was worth a try. But let's be honest, the batting average has gone down. Yep, the strikeouts are, are way up. The on-base percentage is not, is not higher than it once was. Um, the game has devolved in that particular sphere. So if it's devolving, you know, pull the ripcord and go back to what you know is the right way to get it done. Um, stop hiring these people with zero professional baseball experience because you as a front office guy are threatened by the thought that uh, a real baseball man might pipe up in the middle of a meeting and say, yeah, I don't think that's going to work. They're hiring a bunch of no experience. Yes, men, because they're worried about being questioned. They're worried about being called onto the mat. If you're going to do it this way, put the Jersey on yourself and go down there and manage. Stop embarrassing yourself by by hiring these these people that'll do as you're told, as they're told all day long, and stay in their lane because they're so happy to have a job in pro ball. I mean, give me a break. You got you got guys that never ever caught at the highest levels, or even even the high minor league levels. They're they're, they're and they're they're the catching instructors in the minor leagues for these teams. And what are they teaching? They're not even teaching what they did. They're teaching this newfangled crap that is obviously not working. So, I mean, when are they going to pull the ripcord and admit they were wrong? It's fine. Keep trying stuff. I'm all for trying new things. I love analytics. I think they are a wonderful tool. And they, But they are a tool that should be put in the hands of a proper baseball man. I liken it to this, Mitchie. I got a pickup truck right out there in a parking lot. Okay, I can go down to Home Depot and fill it, fill it to the brim with the best tools that money could buy. Most modern technology on a job site that you've ever seen. And I could drive it to a job site. But if skilled laborers, workers that understand how to build things don't show up and put those tools in their hands, ain't nothing going to get built. Plain and simple. You're right. It's it's. And that's what it, that's what it's completely about. It's it's guy. You talk about just analytics. You know, how about the universal DH now? I mean, they talk about wanting to speed the games up. If I remember correctly, I think the American League games seem this went a lot longer than the National League games. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. correct? I don't mind the, the universal DH, um, 
but don't don't say you're trying to speed the game up and put a DH in the National League because you're right about that. Those National League games were way quicker because, I mean, let's be honest. You know, in 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 the in the heyday, you're talking about as a as a National League starting pitcher, you're only facing like six good hitters, maybe seven if you're on on the best team in the league. <laughs> eight eight is 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 a punch and Judy, probably a defensive specialist. Nine's the pitcher. You know, seven might be a 250 hitter with a grip with a defensive specialty. Um, you're not speeding the game up. You know, I think the universal DH is smart. Uh, but what they need to do is get rid of interleague play. They need to balance the schedule so that it's a true test of who the top four teams in each league is. And then you have the top four teams in each league. You know that you know that it's fair because everybody played each other the same amount of times throughout the year. It wasn't a matter of oh, the Texas Rangers got to play the worst team in the National League, the Cincinnati Reds, in their interleague play, so they had an unfair advantage when it came to their record. No, there's no there's no interleague play. Everybody plays each other the same amount of times. Universal DH, plain and simple. So everybody's playing by the same rules in the playoffs in the World Series. Be done with it. There's your fairness. There, There's equity. There is a real testament, and it respects the regular season. Yeah, get rid of the American League and National League, right? There's no more American League, no more National League now. The way it's set up, it's just it's just Major League Baseball. You have, like they used to be, right? You have your West and your East. Just you know, other sports that do it that way. That way, it's because everybody. You said that you have that balance of doing it and having everybody being able to play. You know, the interleague was was fun. I always I did like the idea when when they did start interleague of switching to where. If an American League team went to a National League ballpark, they would play American League rules so they could see it that way, you know, and then vice versa. I, I was I was for that to be able to see it to to do that and to, you know to see other cities, but but you're right now it's just it's just one league and then just figure out a way to do it. Yeah, it's run its course. I mean, honestly, there there aren't there aren't there are only a couple of you know there, there's New York versus New York, Chicago versus Chicago, you know, L.A. versus L.A. But if the teams aren't any good, who cares? Who cares? I mean, I would still much rather watch the Cubs play the St. Louis Cardinals, you know, the Yankees versus Boston. Um, I'd rather see more of that than, you know, the Yankees versus the Mets. Who cares? Yeah. And Manfred, I don't think he's got many friends right now around baseball <laughs> and, and outside yeah, of not. it. You know, and I don't think – I. gosh, I just – the stuff that he's – and he's just blaming it on everything else. Apparently, Rod Carew really laid into him uh, at the Hall of Fame – meeting from what I was gathering so it'll be interesting to see where he where he ends up taking this I don't know much, how much longer he's going to be going to be doing this but they've got to figure something out quick well I'll tell you what he he is doing the same thing that a lot of politicians in our country are doing right now doubling down on their bullshit they're not admitting they were wrong they're just doubling down on their bullshit plain and simple you know it, w- 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 you know I know I know that you know the old timers like me, you know, Fry Daddy, you know, our generation, we're gonna we're gonna sound like disgruntled men. But I can tell you right now, I don't care how much money these guys make. Good, you're the best 750 baseball players in the world. Make all you can. It's a nine and a half billion dollar industry. Money's got to go somewhere. Might as well go to the players. Okay, I'm never gonna begrudge a guy for making a pile of money. But what I want to do is be able to turn on the television and enjoy the game. I want to see strategy. I want to see a triple for Christ's sake. Uh, I want to see, you know, situations make sense. I want to see a guy choke up and go the other way. I'd love to see more of what I saw the other day in the Braves Houston game where a guy just plinks one through a vacant shortstop because the, the team that was on defense is being stupid. And they're basically giving you a tie ball game with an, with an ill-advised shift at the end of the game. All right, take advantage of it. Just hit a routine ground ball to shortstop. He got a double out of it. They basically, the Astros basically gave them, the Braves, a W once the initial base runners run. Let's see more of that. Let's see baseball. You know, I I don't know if these kids can handle it, though, because, you know, we might see a middle infielder cry if somebody was allowed to break up a double play. Not sure they'd understand what to do. Or a catcher, he might have to, he might have to sue somebody or go into like, you know, therapy. Uh, mental therapy if somebody ran him over at the plate he'd be wow that was you know really hurtful and you know it, it was damaging to my mental health like ah uh, yeah no I, i'm not sure we could handle it we might have to start over again yep ghost runners on second base guys sliding well, around wearing oven mitts 
sliding oh, out bases. <laughs> well, you know, the, the oven mitt thing, you know, if you're, if you're not smart enough to pick up a, a ball of dirt to keep your hands off the ground or put your batting gloves in your hands, because that's really all you're doing. You're wearing the oven mitt because you slide head first, which is stupid. It's actually slower. People don't understand. They think it looks cool, but sliding head first is actually slower than the pop-up slide. You have to slow down to bend over and then dive. So you've actually lost two whole steps when you slide head first. The only reason to slide head first is to avoid a tag at a base. Um, but you can accomplish that with a proper hook slide if, if, if they even t still teach that. Um, the old Willie you, Mays you know, Hayes. The old yeah, Willie. the Willie Mays Hayes. Exactly. Man, I used to love the hook slide. I used to employ. I used to do it all the time. And it, you get it. You get there faster. You, you don't have to slow down and bend over. It's the same thing with all these TV dives in the outfield. When you slide, you actually slow down. And I used to wear Kevin Pilar. I used to call him a TV diver because he would dress up almost every play. If you're if you're leaving your feet for a ball that's above your waist, you're a moron. All you gotta do is run through it, and you're gonna get there faster. It makes no sense. If the ball's below your waist, yeah, you should leave you should leave your feet to catch it. But they above played your waist, it, played into a dive. You play it into a dive, but actually you slow down and you, by hitting the ground after you dove, you actually increase the chance the ball's going to pop out of your mitt. What are you doing? You're just trying to dress shit up and make yourself look better. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You know, it's funny. We talk about the, the injury part of it. Remember, remember in Huckabee and the play with Jeter at third? Yeah. I'm surprised that yeah, they yeah. didn't change something there too. That, that whole rule. Can you imagine if that was now? What it happened? I know Huck got a whole bunch of death threats for everything else. What he did with with Jeter, right? we tell our kid that's why right. you don't slide head first right here. This is why. There it is. You're, it's a vulnerable position you're putting yourself in. Those are big boys out there. You know, even me, I wasn't a, I wasn't a big guy, but if my full weight comes down on you, and your shoulders are you're, you're exposed, you're going you're going to the DL, pal. Like how many times? How many broken fingers, dislocated thumbs do you see from guys you know diving head first into a base at full speed? Like, good Lord, it just doesn't make any sense. I understand, you know, it looks cool and you think you get there faster and you think you get down lower, but you're actually slower when you dive head first. Plain simple. I'll prove it to anybody that wants to argue with it. You take over managing, Zonny. I would love to manage, but they won't hire anybody. I even, I've even told multiple clubs, look, I'm overqualified to be an A-ball manager, but I'll do it because A, I would actually like to go to the minor leagues to manage to kind of catch my rhythm and my flow as a manager. I know the game. I, I I'm always three steps ahead of everybody else that's on the field. Right. Even in today's game, I'm watching things that are happening in the game, the rare games that I do watch and I'm three steps ahead of people, but you still have to catch your flow as a manager. Not that I have to go pay my dues, but I would, I'd go manage a couple of years in the minor leagues just, just to know that I did it. And then, yes, I would love to manage a major league ball club. And it's funny too, because you know, you were you you were around when when I had my my television gig, and everybody thought I was this angry, disgruntled, miserable sob. That was a character that the network wanted me to play. You know, I know the game. I love players. I never forgot how hard it was to play the game, even though a lot of the players that I was covering from a television standpoint accused me of not remembering how hard it was to play. How in the world could somebody with a 250 career batting average and all the injuries that I had over my career, 16 years in the majors, five and a half in the minors, you tell me I forgot how to play, how hard it was to play? Give me a break. I have a lot of respect for players, and I know that players today, they're no different than the players of our day and age. You can, if you're if you're a grown man, you can handle the truth. But a lot of times, front office guys won't tell you the truth, the manager won't tell you the truth. And all you really care about is being told the truth. I had guys tell me flat out, Zon, you ain't going to play. This is our guy. Unless he breaks his leg or has, you know, goes into a coma, you're going to play once every seven to 10 days. Johnny Oates flat out told me, Pudge is our guy. He won the MVP award the year I backed him up, 99. I got 98 at bats in a full season playing behind him. That's unheard of. But I respected Johnny for, you know, to the moon because he told me the truth. And he also told me when I was going to play. All you expect as a player is honesty. Honesty and accountability and fairness. I'm not going to be that guy that goes and shows players up in front of, you know, the, the you know, God and everybody out there on the field. That's private, private meeting stuff. Unless you're, unless you're showing me up on the field, you don't need to worry about it. 
There, there won't be any, any, you know, trashing you in the media, none of that shit. And we'll handle it all behind closed doors, but you'll always know where you stand with a guy like me. And I think, you know, couple that with my knowledge of the game, my knowledge of pretty well every single position on the field and my love for statistics and analytics and how, how to properly apply them. I can't see anybody out there that would be more well-suited for that kind of a job. I mean, clearly as, as a, as a television broadcaster, I had a, a bit of a gift for communicating the game, but Benji, they're not hiring guys like you and me with actual baseball experience. We're terrifying to those people. They want puppets. They want people that they can Absolutely. tell what to do. You're going to play this guy and do this guy. No, it's, and it's, but if you even you just look what? at the success of the teams that, you know, consistently win, it's, it's managers that have played at the level and have earned, you know, put in the work, got, earned their, you know, their stripes and understand where, like, I mean, even, but there are guys too that never really played, but under, still understand it to say, hey, Zon, you're not playing today, you know, do what you need to do, as opposed to every day being a guess, am I playing today? Am I going to do this today? Right. No, you just need a chance to do it. But that's what they want. And there's no accountability even through the, even through the locker room. Yeah. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of, like the best X's and O guy I ever played for with Jim Leland. He never got out of A ball. He was a catcher. He got to A ball with the Tigers. And then he started his minor league managing career, probably in his late twenties. But what did he do? Because he hadn't played at the highest levels, he had to work his way up. And he did. He worked his way up through the system, came up with the White Sox, Tony La Russa days. Then all of a sudden he's with the Pittsburgh Pirates. He gets a managing job. You got guys like Terry Francona that played, you know, probably eight, some odd, 10 years in the big leagues. Guys managed at every level. I played for him in the Arizona Fall League, for Christ's sake. Um, you know, these guys caught their rhythm, you know, back in a day where you had to make a stop at every level, but now they're hiring guys, you know, some of my ex teammates, guys like AJ Hand, Brad Osmus, these guys were hired right out of the front office, never managed a day in their life. And now all of a sudden, because they were catchers, because they have a, a, a feel for the game and understanding of, of what it takes, they're going right from a front office cookie job to managing a big league ball club. Congratulations. Good on you. Happy for you. Um, it takes all kinds, but you look at some of these other guys that are just absolutely handcuffed by the analytics departments. I mean, Kevin Cash, like in a million years, I can tell you right now, one of the, one of the, I think a guy like me would be terrified to an organization because there is no way in hell Snell is coming out of that world series game against the Dodgers. If I'm managing that ball club and I'm sure as hell I'm not going to walk around with a six inch binder that's going to tell me how to behave in every possible situation during a baseball game. Uh, no, thank you. So right there, I probably would have got fired. Uh, Cause there was, if you're watching that game, Snell was absolutely shoving it up the Dodgers. You know what? And the next four hitters that he was going to face in that ball game had struck out a collective eight times. Should the Rays have been worried about getting one more inning out of Snell? Absolutely not. What did they do? They brought in a bullpen that had been seen a hundred times in that series, but give me a break. There's no mystery left. Victoria had no more secrets. The more you expose a bullpen to a team in a short series like that, the more comfy they're going to get with them with maybe the exception of Mariano. But I can tell you right now, if he had to close seven ball games, if they saw Mariano seven times, I'd be worried about appearance six and seven, something blowing up. Exactly. And that's just, and those guys are kind of getting run out. I had the same conversation with uh, Ron Gardenhire about it. He goes, I got guys in the big leagues that shouldn't be above a ball, but I'm yeah. handcuffed. So, I mean, that's what they're, you're right. That's what they're doing. They're just kind of, kind of forcing these guys through. And it'll be interesting to see what, you know, in, in 10, 12 years, what the expectancy of a baseball player is, what their, the lifespan is going to be, as opposed to what it was with us, as it is now with, with what you talk about. I mean, like I said, I looked yesterday at a lineup, six hitter. 205, seven hitter, you know, 222, eight hitter, 194. I'm going to my, I'm telling my son, I'm going, what? This is baseball? This is, <laughs> how can you put this kind of a product on the field? Yeah, you can't. I mean, that's embarrassing. If I was the fans, I'd be in revolt right now. I mean, I would understand those numbers if it was like two weeks into the season, guys hadn't caught their groove yet, but we're, we're past the all-star break. We're, we're almost to September and guys are still hitting under 200. And they're not going to get above it probably at oh, this rate. Oh, God, no. No, can you imagine that going on the baseball card? I can, because it happened to me. I got 300 ABs in 1998. And I hit 183. That's like the most embarrassing. I won't even look at my baseball card because that 183 is going to be there forever. Oh my gosh, how things have changed, Zonny, from us to, yeah. to now. So, like I said, as we just sit back and watch and see 
All we well, can do is hope and, and, and maybe. You watch. I got better things to do. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, I don't really watch either. I just kind of just sit here and, you know, go through social media and just see what's going on and, and yeah. try, <laughs> just try and basically just more of shaking your head about anything else. So, yeah, agreed. But, agreed. But I appreciate it, Zong, you sitting on here today and, and just and, and shooting a proverbial uh, shit with us. But what I, you know, Absolutely, having fun, man. like I said, definitely fun. have to do it again and follow up and see how this uh, all transpires here in the next next few months, few years, and just see where our great game ends up. So, but I yeah, appreciate you know it, man. it, man. I'm always I'm always here if you need to get into the grumpy old man routine. I'm, oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm we probably should get <laughs> just, just get a group of all the old guys together and just sit here and see, oh, if, and maybe get some of the newer guys and see if we can actually have a little uh, little powwow just to see what their actually their thought process was. As uh, opposed I to think what ours was. I, I think the younger guys are dying to be coached by legitimate coaches. I think they're dying for it. I mean, I know there's some softies that are going to go whine to their agents and maybe call the, the GM and say, oh, you hurt my feelings, but I think they're dying to be taught. They can't possibly be, they can't possibly be happy with a 205 batting average. I mean, look at a guy like Clay Bellinger. His dad played in the big leagues, for Christ's sake. He grew up watching real baseball. He can't possibly be proud of what he's throwing out there right now. And being around it too, being around the that uh, the you know that right? that presence of just being around those oh. those kind of guys and knowing, man, this this just isn't me. Bellinger was teammates with the Yet with Jeter and Mariano and Posada and Pettit, so you know Clay grew up in that clubhouse. Absolutely, knowing what it was. I mean, it's it's just yeah. Well, we'll see to see how he turns it around if if he does. I hope so. Yeah, we'll you hope so. There could be other some underlying issues, you know, that they don't that we don't know about, but it'll be interesting to see. So, yeah. But uh, I will be well, my man. I will, Zonny. Like I said, get in town, play some golf, but it was good talking to you. Yeah, I'd love to get to Texas anytime soon. Come I'll on. holler at you. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Be well. Thanks, Zonny. Later. Yep.